Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Circuit Python Weekly for November twenty second, twenty twenty one. Yes, that is accurate. Uh, this is the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things Circuit Python. I'm Katney, and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on Circuit Python. Circuit Python is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support them and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join there anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting uh, in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with a U.S. holiday. If the meeting time has changed, we'll notify you via Discord. If you wish to be notified about changes to the meeting, we can add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. There is also a calendar available that we try to keep updated if you'd like to subscribe to that. This meeting is recorded. We record audio from the voice channel and video of the text channel. If you'd rather not have your voice recorded, you're still welcome to participate. A video of this meeting will be posted to YouTube and the audio is released as a podcast. If you find this podcast is not available on your favorite podcast service, please let us know. There is a notes doc to accompany the meeting and recording. If you wish to participate, but you can't make it to the meeting, you can leave hug reports and status updates for us in the document, and we'll read them off during the meeting. The notes document also contains timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use the doc to view only the parts of the video that interest you most. This meeting tends to run around 60 to 90 minutes, though lately it's been about an hour, and this gives you time to, uh, or this gives you the option to skip around. A link to the notes document is posted to the CircuitPython dev channel in the Adafruit Discord every week. Uh, check the pinned messages to find the latest notes doc. This meeting is held in five parts. The first part is community news, which is a look at all things CircuitPython um, and Python on hardware in the community. It's a preview of our Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. The second part is the state of CircuitPython libraries and Blinka. This is a statistical overview of the entire project, which is a chance to look at the project by the numbers, separate from what we're all up to. The third part is hug reports. Hug reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing and taking the time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. The fourth part is status updates. Status updates is an opportunity to sync up on what we've been up to. Take a couple minutes to talk about what you've been doing in the last week since the last meeting and what you'll be up to over the next week until the next meeting. And the fifth part is in the weeds. In the weeds is an opportunity for more long form discussions. These discussions sometimes come out of status updates, but can be something you've identified ahead of time is too long for status updates. And that is how the meeting will go. And with that, uh, I will get started with community news. First up, MicroPython adds official SAMD21 and SAMD51 microcontroller support. They've added mainline support for the microchip SAMD21 and SAMD51 microcontrollers. The REPL can now be used via USB VSP or USART using board specified USART pins initialized on startup. Flash usage is flexible. The internal flash block device, SAMD.flash, is initialized within littlefs1 in frozen module boot.py. 64K for SAMD21 and 128K for SAMD51. SPY bus usage is still a work in process. Uh, more information can be found on the MicroPython GitHub repo. Next up, uh, CircuitPython online IDEs. Um, the idea is simple. Have a web-based development environment for CircuitPython. This eliminates the need for installing software and provides a unified interface. It is definitely possible with newer web technologies built into modern builds of the Chrome web browser. GitHub user Mr. Coxwell started, one, started this trend two years ago. The idea was picked up by user Sensebox eight months ago. Most recently, user URFDVW has made progress with a rather nice web-based editor fittingly called CircuitPython Online IDE. Available in English and Chinese, the project is well-documented and has many features. There are serial console and plot output capabilities. And there are a significant number of uh, links here, both YouTube, GitHub, and uh, link to the actual IDE. The ESP32-S3 mini modules make for an easy S3 feather. Adafruit picked up some ESP32-S3 mini modules from DigiHeat and surprise, they are pin compatible with the S2 mini modules. That means we were able to upgrade the ESP32-S2 feather to the newest dual core BLE chipset. All pins have been tested, NeoPixel works, and so does I2C. 
they're fabricating some of these and we'll have some in the Adafruit shop as soon as we can get a reel from Espresso. And there are posts on the Adafruit blog and YouTube. Next up, wirelessly code your code. <laughs> wirelessly code your Bluetooth device with CircuitPython. Did you know you can transfer files over BLE? This is the basis for being able to edit CircuitPython files directly on your device. Adafruit has been working on a new web-based code editor for CircuitPython. This allows you to edit files directly on your Bluetooth devices using just the Chrome web browser without installing any additional software. The great thing about this code editor is that it's written completely in JavaScript, so it runs only on your computer and none of your data is ever uploaded to a server. And there are links to a learn guide and also to code.circuitpython.org. And then finally, meet the maker, Anne Barella. Adafruit engineer Anne Barella was interviewed for the latest issue of Hackspace Magazine, issue 49. If you've ever programmed anything in CircuitPython and understood the instructions the first time, you probably have Anne Barella to thank. She's a consulting engineer at Adafruit where she puts her vast array of experience into helping people make cool stuff that just works. She had her work go into space on the shuttle and she helped to make the world's computer make sure the world's computers didn't melt when the clocks reset to zero in year 2000 and she's been a big fan of open source. We got a bit flustered when we spoke to her to be honest. Where do you start with a career that's included Caltech, Hewlett Packard, NASA, Boeing and the US diplomatic service? So we started with something we can all understand, circuit python. You can read about Anne, her varied professions, her making trajectory and what she's doing now in the latest Hackspace magazine. So this has been the, a preview of the CircuitPython weekly newsletter, which is a CircuitPython community-run newsletter emailed every Tuesday. The complete archives are available on adafruitdaily.com slash category slash CircuitPython. It highlights the latest Python and hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. To contribute your own projects or news, edit next week's draft on GitHub and submit a pull request. Uh, and that's github.com slash adafruit slash circuitpython dash weekly dash newsletter and uh, submit a PR with the changes. You can also tag a tweet on circuitpython or hash, hashtag circuitpython on Twitter or email cpnews at adafruit.com. And that is community news. Next up is the state of circuitpython, libraries, and Blinka. This is a chance to look at the uh, entire circuitpython project by the numbers. Uh, to see how things are going, um, get an idea of the health of the project. We will talk about the project overall, then uh, we will specifically talk about the core, the libraries, and Blinka separately from each other. So first up, overall, we had 33 pull requests merged from 21 authors, including a few names I don't recognize, M. Perino, URFDVW, Pixel Clay, Liss Apple, Symantec, and Bill Tubbs, and 12 different reviewers. We had 13 issues closed by six people and 19 opened by 14 people. So we're up a bit, but there are a very large number of folks that were involved in those issues. So that's really good to see. And with that, I will turn it over to Scott to talk about the core. Awesome. Thank you, Katni. OK, so the numbers for the core, this is just the C core for CircuitPython on microcontrollers. Uh, we have 14 pull requests merged from 12 different authors. So thank you to those authors. We had six reviewers. So we're always looking for more reviewers to support our authors. Uh, we have 12 open pull requests. Uh, the oldest is 79 days old. I think a lot of these are also marked as drafts. So um, if you are the author of a draft PR and there's no uh, no work being done on it, it's kind of stalled out and, and it's just not going to get in, please do close it. Um, for uh, Instead, my preference is to have issues that link to those branches. Um, I'd like to keep pull requests for things that are actively being iterated on. Um, so take a look at those if, if you're an author of any, any of those PRs. Uh, Issues-wise, we had four closed issues by three people, seven opened by six people, so we are net up three uh, for a total of 455 open issues. Uh, now we track our issues via milestones, um, and milestones are used to kind of gauge how urgently the different issues are. Um, we have negative two issues not assigned to milestone, which I'm not sure how we get negative, <laughs> um, but that's our bucket for uh, issues that we haven't looked at yet to understand what they should be categorized as. 
Uh, we have zero open issues for 7.1 and we have 23 open issues for 7xx. I suppose that there may be uh, issues in the 7xx category that we do actually want to fix before we call 7.1 stable. If you have any ideas for that, uh, please chime in on those issues and we'll, we'll get them re, re milestoned uh, for 7.1. And that's it for the core. Thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm. All right, next up is the libraries. So this applies to all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is everything that starts with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore on GitHub, as well as a few extras like our cookie cutter and the Adafruit uh, CircuitPython community, or Adafruit community bundle, rather. CircuitPython community bundle. I'll get there. Um, so across all these repos, we had 18 pull requests merged from 10 different authors and 10 different reviewers, uh, leaving us with 63 open pull requests. We had eight issues closed by four people and 12 open by nine people, leaving us with 636 open issues. Uh, if you're interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, check out circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all of these uh, open PRs and open issues available um, listed out. Uh, you can search the issues by label for uh, folks that are new to everything. Good first issue is a great place to start. Um, we currently have 258 good first issues. And if you're looking for something more complicated, bug or enhancement is also an excellent thing to search for. And um, if you find anything that interests you, comment on the issue and let us know you're working on it. If you need help with it, please let us know. Um, we're available both on GitHub and on Discord um, to assist with any of that. We also have a guide on contributing to Git and GitHub, or contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub um, available for you to use if you are new to both of those. So don't let that intimidate you. We want to make sure that you're able to contribute in a way that works best for you. If you're interested in helping out with reviewing, uh, take a look at the open pull requests and uh, if you have the hardware, test it. If you are just commenting on the code, let us know. Um, anything that you uh, wanna let us know about what you've taken a look at is super helpful. And once you're more comfortable with that, we can look at leveling you up to the review team. In terms of library updates in the last seven days, there's one new library, Adafruit Circuit Python Async IO, and a huge list of updated libraries. Um, there is a link to the full uh, Circuit Python library report. Um, it was many, many pages. Uh, so we just finished a library update sweep, which is why there were too many updated libraries to list in the notes document. We're continuing to see excellent contributions and updates to the libraries. Thank you to everyone who's been submitting updates over the last week and beyond. And as well, thank you to the review team. You all make it possible for us to continue moving forward at such a uh, such a pace. We could not do it without you. Most of the time, by the time I get to a PR in my email, it's already been reviewed, which is greatly appreciated. And that is what I have for the library. So next up, I will turn it over to Melissa to talk about Blinka. Hello. Blinka is our CircuitPython and MicroPython compatibility layer for uh, Raspberry Pi and other single board computers. And this week, we had one pull request merged by one author and two reviewers. Uh, there are still three open pull requests. There was one closed issue by one person and zero open by zero people, leaving a net of 64 open issues amongst all the repos. Uh, in the last month, we had 14,087 Pi Wheels downloads, and there are currently 77 boards supported. And that's it. Thanks very much. Next up is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is an opportunity for us to highlight the fun things that folks are doing um, in the community, uh, all the uh, positive feedback and that sort of thing that we can give. Um, there's not enough of it, so we try to do it uh, every week. And uh, this is held as a round robin where I will start and then I'll go down the list alphabetically and loop back to the top to give everybody who wants to a chance to participate. So first up, I have a hug report to Jerry for testing the BME280 on the Feather ESP32S2 for accuracy and providing me with the testing examples so I have something to start with. It turns out we're going to include an Adafruit IO example in the guide, and I have personally never worked with Adafruit IO, so this example is going to be incredibly useful because it is giving me the entire starting point I need, and all I need to do is tweak a couple of timing things. Um, Next up, uh, to Keith the EE for learning the release part of the library PR review process. Um, it's an important uh, part of PR reviews and not everyone is aware of how to do that. And so it's excellent to see another person um, pop up. Uh, so we're not putting that all on one person. 
um, to Dylan for finishing up the library update suite, to Foamy Guy for catching an issue with Read the Docs on some of the libraries and for looking into the fix, and to Jeff for keeping me up on his trip with some lovely pictures. Next, I have some notes for um, Keith the EE, uh, to me, Katni, for helping out with uh, a project on the Python that the Python Discord is developing, to Foamy Guy for guiding me through the library release process, and to everyone for being an awesome community. And next up is Maker Melissa. Hello, uh, I wanted to give a hug report to Katni. Um, for helping me out with the uh, ESP32S2 Feather Bootloader and Group Hug everyone else. Excellent. Next up, I have some notes for Mark Gambler, uh, who has a hug report for Tan Newt for the discussion on the IS31 and review and a group hug. And next up is Scott. Hello. Uh, first, a hug to TAC for tweaking 10 USB for the Raspberry Pi 02W support. Uh, next, a hug to 560 for testing the Broadcom build process and reporting back about it. And last up, a hug uh, to Microdev for continuing to work on the ESP32 S3 uh, and C3 and ESP IDF 4.4 stuff. So I'm excited for that. And that's it for me. Excellent. Next up, I have some notes from Anik Data, who said, uh, hug report to Dan H and Foamy Guy for help troubleshooting a bitmap font library issue. And next up is Carter. Are you actually here today? Or are you lurking? I'm gonna vote lurking. Ah, okay, excellent, lurking. So, um, I have notes from Carter, who has a hugger report for Tan Newt for some quick help finding info on the EPD feature border color. Next, I have some notes from C. Grover, who is text only today, who has a hug report for Foamy Guy and Dexter Starboard for testing and reviewing the scalable retro widgets project. I appreciate the comments and suggestions, as well as the opportunity to try new to me coding techniques. Excellent. Next up, I have notes from Charles Berniford, who has a group hug and a happy Thanksgiving. Next up is Dan. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to thank uh, Pixel Clay, who starting, started a Russian translation and did a whole bunch of it already. It's like 20 or 25% complete already. So it's really nice to have a brand new translation. And thanks to URF DVW, who's a native speaker of uh, Mandarin and is, is um, editing and improving the pinyin translation. And then thanks to Microdev, who gave me a five minute fix for a problem I was having with tracebacks today. I reported it and it was fixed almost immediately. Thank you very much. Okay. Excellent. Next up, I have notes from David Glauda, who says group hug. And then next up is Foamy Guy. Foamy Guy is up. Are you text only today? I'm gonna read it off. But oh. now, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um. I, let me reread the first one here. I got two instances going for the recording, so it seems like I need to unmute both. Um, first hug this week for C. Grover, who published some really cool display I.O. widgets. Uh, anybody who's interested in display I.O. stuff, definitely recommend you take uh, a look at those. There's some really neat stuff in there. Um, to Joey Castillo, as well as there were many other uh, folks that gave talks at uh, over the weekend at Hackaday Remoticon. Uh, I found Joey's really, uh, really interesting, but there were also lots of other really neat stuff going on over the weekend. So um, thank you to all the folks who gave talks and participated in Remoticon. Um, to Anik Data, who found uh, an issue with the bitmap font library and reported it um, over the weekend or, or this past week. Uh, I don't remember exactly when that was, but I appreciate them finding that and uh, letting us know about it. And then uh, lastly, to Keith the EE, for learning the release process. Uh, definitely echo uh, what Katni mentioned. It's really nice to have more folks come in on board 
to do the uh, releases. So thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Next, I have some more notes to read from G3 Holiday, who has a hug report to Tanute for bare metal CP support on 02 and everyone involved in the 7.1 beta. And last but not least is Jerry. Uh, hi. Um, so let's see a group hug and uh, happy Thanksgiving to all those who celebrate it. Excellent. And that ends hug reports. Yes. So next up is status updates. Status updates is an opportunity uh, for us to sync up on what we've been up to since the last meeting, what we're going to be up to until the next meeting. Um, so take a couple minutes, uh, read off, um, read off your notes, what you've been up to. Um, if you are text only, please make sure that you have written text only in there. Um, there's a couple of people that I see who were text only for hug reports and perhaps they are not for status updates, but if they are, uh, please make sure that gets updated. Um, I'm going to update one of them right now. Who's not in the meeting, it, think, it looks like. All right. So this is a round robin as well, where I will start and go down the list alphabetically and loop back around just like I just did. So first up is me. Uh, so last week, published the guide for the 1.12 inch monochrome OLED. Um, that's a fun little display. There's a new example for it. It is 128 by 128, which is what is newest about it. More pixels in a tiny format. Um, it's actually much smaller than I thought it was once I got it physically. Um, anyway, there's a brand new example for that both in Arduino and um, CircuitPython that uses the whole display because the previous version was 64 by 128. Um, so that's uh, that's been updated. Um, I published seven new PyLeap guides. PyLeap is um, a fun new thing where you go to an app on your iPhone and you can view um, guide code and send it directly to a Bluetooth enabled device. In this case, all of these examples were written for Circuit Playground X, uh, Circuit Playground Blue Fruit, rather. Um, I don't know that they are in the app yet, so I don't know that they're PyLeap enabled yet, but they will get there and then eventually there will be lots more um, for you to do with your um, Blue Fruit and your iOS device. Um, I started the guide for the Feather ESP32 S2. It is mostly done except for filling in the essentials templates. I got Dylan spun up on pretty pins, the pretty pins diagrams that we're trying to do for all boards. Um, I was pretty much the only person doing them. And uh, so we brought somebody else um, into the fold on that one, which is excellent. And then various miscellaneous whatnot. Um, this week, finishing up the Feather ESP32 S2 guide. Um, I have to fill, finish filling in the essentials templates, which actually um, I need to duplicate one of the templates and then change some wording in it because the ESP32 S2, as well as apparently the S3 and also the NRF52840 boards all have a um, different uh, AREF than um, say the SAMD21 and the SAMD51. So when you are checking voltage on an analog pin um, using analog in, uh, it doesn't show up as 3.3 volts. Um, it's all documented if there's reasons, but the long, long, short version of that story is that I need to make a template that works with these boards because the current analog in template assumes 3.3 volts and that is incorrect. And then the last two things to do is upload the PCB files to GitHub and do the pretty pins diagram. And then any miscellaneous that comes up and the next guide that I'm doing is the um, KB2040, which is a new board that we are going to be releasing very soon. And uh, next up, I will turn it over to maker Melissa. Hello. Um, so last week, I finished up the CircuitPython Code Editor Learn Guide. I updated the Raspberry Pi Blinko Learn Guide with the uh, Python Extended Bus Library page. I updated the BrainCraft and VoiceBana audio page with Python usage information. Uh, I added a bunch of missing boards to circuitpython.org, uh, the website. And for this this week, it'll be a short week for me because of Thanksgiving and I'm also uh, volunteering at a local food bank. And then I'm working 
on the days that I am working, I'm working on a new guide involving using CircuitPython to control a laser. And that's it. Excellent. All right, next up, I have notes to read from Mark Gambler, who submitted the IS31PR and took it out of draft and looking for ways to incorporate the ring lights in a Python helper library. And that would be on the um, LED glasses. Uh, next up is Scott. Hello. Um, similar to Melissa, uh, this is a short week for me due to Thanksgiving. I will be making an apple pie. <laughs> Last week, I got the Broadcom builds going in the CI and optimized the submodule checkout along the way. Um, so that was good. Uh, there's a, an outstanding issue on the Pi Zero Two W. So I'm, I'm, but I, it's really hard to track down. So I'm, I'm curious to see if folks have success with it and whether somebody can fix it for me too. Uh, so I'm still gonna get the PR out th uh, this week and uh, more folks trying it and uh, we'll, we'll hopefully get more eyes on it and find some more bugs. Um, we can always iterate on it as it's checked after it's checked in the main and it's been a long time coming so I just want to get it done uh, I'll start I, this week the one thing I have to do before I do that is I need to go over the commits and just make sure that there's no debug prints or anything in the unrelated files um, just so that, just so that I don't mess up the uh, don't mess up the uh, history for things and uh, no deep dive this week I'm definitely gone uh, Thursday and Friday completely but Tuesday Tuesday Wednesday I'll be off and on uh, as I as we prep for Thanksgiving dinner. That's that's what's up with me. Thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm. Next up, I have notes for C. Grover. This week, added new widgets to the Scalable Retro Widgets project. Thoroughly enjoyed Foamy Guy's review during his stream. Will have some improvements coming based on his and Dexter Starboard suggestions. Submitted a PR for display shapes dot line class to allow line color change post instantiation needed this for the HP 35 display module widget. And there is a picture in the notes. Next, add three new widget prototypes to the library. We'll continue to look for ways to improve UI and subsequently expand my Python skill set if I can successfully rearrange a few stubborn synapses. Refocus on creating a displayed underscore shapes dot arc graphics primitive Review display shapes that round rect outlining method to see why circles morph into squares when the stroke value increases and revise last year's animated matrix portal snowman decoration will either add a blizzard mode or something related to global warming. Next up is Dan. Okay, thanks. Wrapping around. Um, so I've been working almost exclusively on the async IO learn guide. Um, there's a lot of text in it explaining about tasks and cooperative multitasking and things like that. So it's sort of more of a textbooky kind of thing than a project at all. Uh, you can see the work in progress. There's a preview link that I put in the notes. Uh, feel free to look at that. Uh, give me feedback if you like. It's still very much a work in progress. Uh, the things in the guide are tested. You need uh, CircuitPython 7.0.0 beta 1 and the async I.O. library, which is in the bundle. Um, in the course of writing up some of this, like I'm starting to write up some pages about task cancellation and exception handling, and I found some problems when I was uh, working on the examples. So I have to take a bit of a break and fix those problems before I can continue with those guide pages. But we'll pro we may publish the guide in kind of a, a half-finished form to get wider um, exposure. But please take a look if you want. All right, thank you. Yeah, we definitely would, would like any feedback um, on this guide. And the code in it um, really is the most important thing. We want to know especially how people are going to be using it. Um, so next up, I have some notes from David Glada, who says, testing CircuitPython on Pi02W and Pi3A after each deep dive stream, turning an MCP2221 into a console cable for the Pi UART, testing and creating a simple test for the NES mini controller with the WeChuck library, and trying to boot a Pi B stick RP2040 into CircuitPython. Failure, but it works with the Pico MicroPython firmware. Next up is Foamy Guy. 
All right, thank you, Katney. Let me shuffle back to this window. Okay, uh, this week, a uh, couple of things I worked on. I finally uh, got around to making a macro pad configuration using the main project from the guide. I've done several things with the macro pad at this point, but I never did actually make a configuration for that sort of main uh, macro project that I, I think JP or somebody else, I'm not entirely sure who put that together, but um, that was really cool. And I set mine up to help me score the trivia that took place um, during the Hackaday Remoticon. Um, some other stuff I was doing was playing around with the those widgets that C Grover has created. And uh, the main thing I did is try out a couple of them and built uh, an example that runs on the clue that makes a, a little sound reactive um, bar graph that's kind of needed, bounces up and down with whatever sound uh, that it can hear uh, coming from the microphone on the clue. Um, I made a small fix inside a cookie cutter that was resulting in some missing new lines showing up in some of the Python files. Um, for this upcoming week, uh, I will try out some different configurations for read the docs. We found uh, an issue in some of the libraries that are causing them not to build correctly. So I'm going to test out some of the different versions that it uses, as well as put in PRs on the ones we know of that have trouble. Um, I got my Adabox uh, this past week. I was uh, put my order in kind of like really late, so I was not amongst the first uh, shipment, but mine did come in. So I'm excited to play with the hardware that's inside there, which I haven't had uh, a chance to play with yet. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. And then uh, the other thing that I have going on this week is uh, looking into refactoring bitmap font um, to use the with context processors from Python. Uh, we had made that change, but it turns out that there are some more substantial changes that need to go along with it to make that library work uh, using that newer with context uh, sort of methodology. So I'll be taking a look at that this week. Uh, thanks. Excellent. Next up, I have notes from G3 Holiday. This is kind of trying to work on a CircuitPython scrolling text method for the iLight glasses and debugging Thonny Python with ESP32-S2 and NRF52840 issues with not running code after changes are made. And finally, uh, last up is Jerry. Thanks. Um, so yeah, I spent a bunch of time playing with the, uh, the new uh, ESP32 S2 Feather with the BME 280 on board. And when I first ran it, I was a little disappointed because the BME 280 got really hot. <laughs> uh, I was reading about 15 degrees high and you just run in, in normal use. So I decided to do some testing. So I put a, a SI7021 temperature sensor on the STEMI connector and um, and then ran some tests that put data out to AIO so I can see what's going on. So what I find is that under normal use, if you just turn the board on and start reading the temperature, you're going to get values up by at least 15 degrees Fahrenheit um, due to heating because of the, the chip getting hot. But when you use deep sleep, uh, and I was using it with a five-minute cycle, so it would go to sleep for five minutes, wake up, take a reading. Um, and if you do it under battery power, it works great. Uh, the temperature between the two sensors converged right back down and got within a degree of each other. And stayed that way for for days, um, but then it turns out um, the battery finally ran out, so I had to charge the battery up. When I plugged in the wall charger, uh, no data this time, just just battery charging. All of a sudden, the board started heating up again, and the BME 280 went up by 10, almost 15 degrees again. So that that was kind of a surprise. I guess not really surprising because the charging circuit generates a fair amount of heat apparently. Um, but then I also noticed that if you um, let the battery fully charge. Um, as the charge rate drops near the end of the cycle, the things start cooling off again. So it clearly is charge rate dependent. And when it finally does reach full charge, it goes right back to being being normal. So just some heads up to people who are playing with it. Um, bottom line is it works great if you let it go to sleep and uh, wake it up and make a measurement. Um, then there were some issues that got reported on a forum thing about the RFM69. Most of them, I opened a couple of issues based on it. Most of it will be satisfied by fixing up the documentation and then just kind of think about whether there are some sort of feature enhancements that should be put in to, to uh, take care of the rest. I'll look at that in the next couple of weeks. That's it. Great. All of that um, information about the battery stuff and heating up and so on is going to go in the guide. So that'll be good. Thanks. Yeah. That was, that, was, that was fun to do. 
All right. And that is status updates, which brings us to In the Weeds, um, which there are no topics for. In the Weeds is our time to have long form discussions that don't make sense for status updates or are unrelated to somebody's status updates, but a discussion that somebody wants to have. Um, so uh, I will go ahead and wrap us up then. This has been the CircuitPython Weekly for November 22nd, 2021. Um, scrolling, scrolling. Uh, let's see, thank you to everyone who participated. If you wanna support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. The next meeting will be held as usual next Monday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. This meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join by going to adafru.it slash discord. To be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. We hope to see you all next week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Katni.